It's it's certainly my pleasure to be here, and uh, and I and I I don't know if you were in the other thing, but uh, but I grew up, you know, I was born in Passaic, New Jersey, and grew up in Clifton. So, though no one from Philadelphia recognized that until I say coffee and because, and then they say, okay, I know where you're from. Anyway, um, I, I'm gonna. A lot, I'm going to try to go move things along and primarily talk about the cool stuff. But, um, but multiple myeloma is characterized by significant immune dis uh, dysfunction, right? Abnormal cytokine profiles, defective T cell activation, increased expression of PD-1 and TGF beta, downregulation of NKG2D, decreased immune surveillance, uh, you know, screwed up uh, 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 antigen presenting cells. Cells, aberrant support uh, uh, cells like myeloid derived suppressor cells. In fact, we have a cool study where we're using monoclonal antibodies to attack those things. So it's a screwed up immune system. And so, um, so how do we sort of bolster the immune system? In, uh, in myeloma. As you know, the, the number one thing that we've been doing for many years is the immunomodulatory agents, right? You know, pomalidomide and, and lenalidomide, they, they're, they're Im they truly are immune modulators. Um, and then, of course, the new uh, monoclonal antibodies that I'll talk a very briefly about because I think you've heard about it three times already, the daratumumab and the elotuzumab. And then what I want to focus most on are the cellular uh, therapies that are being developed, uh, both the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, uh, the CAR T cells, and the T-cell the T receptor engineered T cells. Um, so immunotherapy for myeloma. Currently available are the IMIDs, the monoclonal antibodies, the anti-CD38, anti-SLAM F7 CS1, elotuzumab and daratumumab, and then immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, pembrolizumab and, nivo uh, and nivolumab. And then the future, science fiction soon to be available, are the cellular immunotherapy. So the monoclonal antibodies, again, you've heard a hundred times about this. So elotuzumab anti, uh, seems to uh, natural killer cells and myeloma cells have the SLAM F7, the CS1 on their surface. And so we think that the way this monoclonal antibody works is by both um, putting a flag in a myeloma cell and activating the T cells to then attack a, uh, a, a, a plasma cell. And you know the, the, the studies of Lendex versus ELO Lendex showing the uh, benefit of uh, ELO Lendex in terms of response rate, in terms of duration of response with, with very little toxicity um, increase, 10% uh, infusion reactions with pre-medications, et cetera. Daratumumab, we've, we've heard about with the anti-CD38 directed, uh, direct anti-tumor effect. Most, if not all, myeloma cells have CD38 on their surface, but it also has immune-mediated activity as well as um, uh, immunomodulation um, and uh, and and you know the, the the studies the original study it's really it's sort of interesting how how they were so nervous about the development of this antibody because CD38 is on many more things than just uh, plasma cells uh, that they started with homeopathic doses of this in uh, Scandinavia as Dr. Uh, Sonnenfeld was talking about and uh, once they finally got to about four milligrams per kilogram, uh, they started seeing responses. And, and so this, was, this is just a recent report from the last ASH where they combined the patients in the phase two trial, which was a New England Journal of Medicine article, as well as the ones who got the 16 milligrams per kilogram, which is sort of the standard dose of daratumumab, um, from the phase one trial, and just demonstrated that, as we know, when you use it as a single agent, about a third of the patients respond. Um, but I think what is sometimes forgotten is that somewhere in the neighborhood of another 50% of those patients had stabilization of their disease. And so even as a single agent, we're seeing some uh, real clinical benefit. Um, with, you know, this one, of course, has more of the infusion reactions and the, uh, and, and, and what, and, and I th it sounds like you guys do the same thing we do, which is our referring physicians tend to uh, send for the first dose or two uh, the daratumumab to our center because we have a staffing that's that's long enough to do a potential eight-hour infusion with this, and then usually after the the uh, second infusion, the toxicities and the duration of infusions are so much uh, less that they can they can.
can do it in their, in their local thing. What I learned today, actually, which had never really occurred to me, was, was the, the, there are two twin uh, trials that were done, Castor and Pollux, which are, of course, the Gemini constellation, uh, uh, the main stars in, in Gemini, and also, uh, you know, are the uh, twins from, uh, from mythology. Um, and I'm a Gemini, so I should have known this, but uh, I'm, I guess my parents should have called me Castor. But anyway, so, so there are now two twin studies. Eat, pee. Anyway, so, um, <clears throat> so uh, you know, this was the combination or the comparison of DVD versus VD. Uh, you know, uh, of course, when we think DVD, we think of, uh, of an anthracycline. But, but it's a daratumumab, and, and as you've seen 25 times today, uh, significant improvement with the in inclusion of this monoclonal antibody um, without really causing a lot more toxicity, though, the, though maybe a little extra infections, maybe a little extra cytopenias. Um, and then, uh, and then the, its twin, the Pollock study, uh, show was DRD, so Dara Revdex versus Revdex, and also showed, um, let's see, do I have it? Oh, I guess I don't have it. But also showed a very significant um, a benefit by the addition of this monoclonal antibody. So, um, um, and, uh, and, and you know, the only, the cool thing, which I don't know if it came up yet, but you know, the cool thing about daratumumab is that monoclonal antibody is, uh, number one, screws up your ability to, to make a CR because the, uh, the antibody it shows up on your SPEPs and so you, you have sometimes a little bit measurable or near CR. Um, but, but sometimes it's of a different uh, IG, you know, IG class, so that's how you sort of figure it out. And uh, the other is it mucks up blood, uh, you know, typing. And so it's always what we do, and I'm sure what you do, is that we always uh, do um, uh, red blood cell typing before we start the daratumumab, so at least we have a good sense of what the um, ABO uh, will be. And so when we get a positive, um, uh, uh, Coombs test, uh, we can uh, get the best matched blood if the patient really needs it, and there are ways of, of, di of getting out the uh, daratumumab. Um, and then, of course, there's the checkpoint inhibitors, the pembrolizumab, et cetera. And the rationale for targeting PD-1 and PD-L1 is that PD-L1 is expressed on plasma cells in an increased way, and this, this allows these plasma cells to evade the immune system and proliferate. And, um, and also the T and NK cells from myeloma patients have functional def defects um, that decrease their activation. So the hypothesis is if you use a uh, PD-1 blockade um, that this will activate the myeloma specific cytotoxic T cells. So it will uh, stimulate the immune system. And, um, and, and interestingly, if you use as a single agent both either pembrolizumab or nivol nivolumab um, uh, in myeloma, there was actually very little evidence of a response at all. So single agent doesn't seem to be sufficient. However, again, there was a stabilization of disease in a good portion of these patients. So maybe there was a little bit more activity than what we initially thought. But um, uh, Badros uh, and, and others uh, at the University of Maryland uh, went the next step and said, all right, well, why don't we add two this uh, checkpoint inhibitor that's stimulating the T cells, an immunomodulatory agent, uh, pembro uh, in this case, pomalidomide, and there's also been studies with lenalidomide, which I don't remember whether I have for you. And so using pembrolizumab in an every two week dosing, uh, similar to what, what is uh, given in a lung cancer or the, every three weeks, pomalidomide in the standard way, four milligrams, uh, three out of every four weeks in DEX, um, given uh, weekly, and they took patients, but in this case, they took patients who had greater than two prior therapies, and they all had been exposed to a proteasome inhibitor and immunomodulatory agent, but they were naive to pomalidomide. But nevertheless, in this setting, where we would expect, you know, from the phase two trials and phase three trials, maybe a third of these patients would respond to, to this uh, just from pomalidomide and decadron, they got 70% they got, uh, of the patients responding. The overall response rate was 66% in 43 patients that were uh, treated, and 70% of the patients who had double refractory um, disease, meaning that they were refractory to the proteasome inhibitor and a uh, lenalidomide, 
um, responded to this therapy. There was some increased toxicity, maybe a 15% um, uh, pneumonitis, um, and, some, and some of the patients had a, um, a, a GI um, inflammatory thing, but, um, but a very high response rate and the progression-free survival in this small group of patients, uh, 33 patients, was something like 14 months. We actually have done um, a similar retrospective analysis. We didn't do it as a prospective study. Just of ten, We have 10 patients now who are pomalidomide resistant or pomalidomide exposed patients where we gave them Pembro Palm Dex and we're gonna, we're, we have a poster at uh, ASH that shows also a similarly very high response rate. So pretty cool. All right, but the main thing I want to talk to you about is the cellular therapy. So remember, the rationale for cellular immunotherapy myeloma is we're not fixing people yet with myeloma despite all the stuff that we've been doing, that the T cells and the NK cells from myeloma patients have been shown to kill autologous myeloma cells, and you know, and we've done allotransplants as your center um, has done, and, um, and it does look like there's a subset of patients, at least, who are long-term relapse-free survivors when we've infused the donor T cells, but of course there's a high morbidity and mortality, and it's usually associated with a graft versus uh, host disease when you get this graft versus tumor effect, and so you're sometimes just substituting one chronic illness for another chronic illness. So what you know, so the philosophy of using autologous engineered T cells is perhaps if we could engineer our own immune cells to specifically attack myeloma, we could get the good graft versus myeloma effect without the bad graft versus host disease. And every, all of these T cell, adoptive T cell therapies um, uh, really have the same um, process where what you do is you take a person's own T cells. In the case of, of um, the uh, CAR T cells or, and the T cell receptor engineered cells, you take it from the blood, a simple uh, steady state um, uh, lymphophoresis. Uh, uh, in the case of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which is um, what uh, the guys at Johns Hopkins have done, they actually go in and suck out bone marrow from the myeloma filled bone marrow and then squeeze out the T cells that are infiltrating that area and then these uh, and, and in the case of the TILs those cells are expanded ex vivo and in the case of the engineered T cells those T cells have um, uh, are injected with a virus that that carries with it genetic material to infect these T cells and put on their surface um, these uh, new T cell receptors, then these patients, ex and then these cells ex vivo are expanded and then are infused into the patient as a therapy, as a drug, right? And, uh, and, and we keep talking about, so what is a chimeric antigen receptor? What it is is simply a uh, sort of an antibody receptor uh, 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 that that is um, engineered. So it's an it can and it's a chimera because it has both that receptor area as well as an intracellular domain that stimulates the cell. So it's got a sort of a standard antibody receptor. It has this hinge region, has a transmembrane domain that is a CD28, usually um, um, a piece of of protein, and then inside the cell are co-stimulatory molecules. The magic is which ones are the best ones, and it looks like the 4-1-BB as a co-stimulatory molecule, as well as a cis-stimulatory molecule of CD3 zeta chain of, of uh, is, tends to be the, the pieces that are inside the cell. And so basically when the cell when, when the receptor latches onto something, it, it, ener it energizes that cell to proliferate and become more active. So it's very cool technology. My son, who's a, uh, a biology major in college, a senior, when he took molecular biology, they actually used this. It was sort of cool. They used this in the first lecture of why you should learn molecular biology because there's actually, and he started, Dad, and then, yeah, now, now he thinks I might know something. Anyway, the, uh, um, so this, these are the three major technologies that require, that were required to have this occur. Number one is the creation of the genetic material 
that would code for this chimeric antigen receptor. The uh, number two was the um, development of a lentiviral vector. So, the, so you actually put this genetic material into a lentivirus and then that and then infect the T cells and um, and that's what gives this genetic material and then an artificial um, dendritic cell, which is a magnetic bead that has on its surface uh, two antibodies, CD3 and CD28, that, that make the T cells think that they're getting infe that an infection's there and activates them to, to do something, right? And this is a cartoon that just shows how they infect the cell, you know, the, it puts on its surface the warhead, and the warhead finds um, a, a, the antigen on the tumor cell to kill it. Um, so, uh, and this is sort of the, the, the diagram of how all of these cellular therapies occur. You first have to leukophorese the appropriate patient and get these T cells out. Ex vivo, you insert the magnetic beads and the virus and you uh, infect the cells. And this whole process takes about 5 to 12 days. Um, and, and then you cook up you expand these cells. Meanwhile, the patient has to have some lymphodepleting therapy so, so that their immune, their T cells are lower so you can squirt in these cells so they can proliferate into the patient. So the number one target that has been used, to, so the chimeric antigen that um, receptor that, it, that they've been directed against is CD19. That has been the number one uh, one that, that has been used. And that's because that's on the surface of most of the malignant B cell diseases like uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma, B cell ALL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. There are over um, 27 trials that have gone on in, in numerous centers throughout the world. Uh, the responses in heavily pretreated chronic lymphocytic leukemia, acute lymphocytic leukemia, B cell, non Hodgkin's lymphoma have been impressive. About 50% of the patients who've received these cells have, um, have had a nice response. About a quarter of the patients with CLL are long term remissions. Our, our best patient was our second patient treated, who is now six years from the infusion just of these cells and is still in complete remission has no evidence of CLL. For ALL, it's even better. I think I'm going to show you that in a second. Something like 90% of the patients, many of them children with ALL, who've just received these cells went into complete remission and, um, and many of them are years, three or four years out from that. Um, and follicular lymphoma, the, the, the low-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphomas also have it. This is not something, though, without toxicity. And the number, the two toxicities are these people have lots of disease in their system, so tumor lysis syndrome, but we, we know how to deal with that. Number two, uh, this stuff is indiscriminate. If it's a CD19 positive cell, it will blow them up, and so normal um, lymphocytes are that, and so they get a B-cell aplasia, and some of these patients need to get continued uh, intravenous gamma globulin. And then cytokine release syndrome, which is the new syndrome that's been developed, which is a sepsis-like syndrome as these cells are proliferating and, 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 infu and causing cytokines, that is fevers, rigors, hypotension. And fortunately, though, we found the antidote. And the antidote is an, an, an or it's driven by interleukin-6. And the test that you follow is ferritin and C-reactive protein. And those things go up as the people get uh, the, this in, in, in inflammation. And then they go down, usually within a couple of weeks. But so if, if the syndrome's getting serious, then by squirting in tocilizumab, an anti-IL-6 receptor monoclonal antibody, it can turn off the syndrome within like four hours. So it really is the secret to the whole thing. This is ALL, um, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% of the, patient, the kids with ALL who've received this thing are long-term doing well when they were dying of ALL. Um, so what about myeloma? There are many targets. So the first question is, what's the best target in myeloma, right? And, um, 
and there are many of these have been, have been occurred. The problem, the thing is, we had CD9, an anti-CD19 car ready for uh, for use, but CD19 is not particularly on the surface of myeloma cells. It's on on all of these other cells. But our hypothesis was that the um, that even though the plasma cells tend to be CD19 negative, they're lymphocytes. So there must be some precursor, some screwed up precursor that's CD19 positive that evolved, you know, that is, is the mother cell of these plasma cells. Uh, additionally, we thought that maybe a CD19 small subset of the, patient, of the cells were the, the resistant clone, and that if you could somehow target those things, you might result with a, a, a better result. But we wanted to design a study that in a few patients might show us some proof of principle. So the study we designed was to take people who had already had, a, had, had initial therapy and autologous stem cell transplant and they were of poor prognosis because the duration of their response was less than a year after their autologous transplant. Then they can get all these different other therapies and then as a and then when they finally, nothing else is working, they need a salvage auto transplant to try to get them better, we would then do a second stem cell transplant and our expectation would be that the duration of that remission would be shorter than the first one um, and then we'd squirt in these cells to see if we could have a remission inversion and try to have a longer duration of remission. So here's the famous patient that we published in the New England Journal and was on the cover of Parade magazine. I'm so sorry. It, it, everyone, everyone, it's not, it was too hyped. It, it, it's not cure, but anyway. So, so and what um, Dave, David showed um, earlier today is the patient had had a initial therapy, a stem cell transplant, did not go into uh, complete remission, progressed within three months. Actually, within six months had IMWG criteria, but actually started progressing in three months. Got 10 lines of therapy after that. Was treated at the Dana-Farber, so got lenalidomide, pomalidomide, bortezomib, carfilzomib, varinostat, elituzumab when it was still in experimental medicine, etc. And, uh, and then we did a stem cell transplant and a few cells, and if I had known that I'd be showing this slide, I would have liposuctioned myself a little bit more. <laughs> this, is her, this is the patient. This is her husband who looks a lot like Peter Sonnefeld, I think. Yeah. So I think that's it. And then the whole team, uh, this is uh, Al Garfall, who's really all the, the brains behind the whole thing. Anyway, um, so what we did was we, um, tried to keep her alive by giving her a little bit of cytoxan infusions, then did a second stem cell transplant. Because she was sort of sickly, we actually gave her a lower dose of melphalan than we gave, gave uh, the first time, 140 milligrams per meter squared. Um, and then two weeks later, infused the CART-19. We wanted her to recover from the acute toxicities of the auto transplant before we squirt in the cells. And boom, she went into the deepest remission she's ever had. And, and, this, is, and this is what we showed in the New England Journal. That, and, and as I said at the meeting, it was about for at least 15 months, so, so where she had a three month um, prior remission, 15 months later, complete remission. And this was, you know, we did every sort of molecular testing we could do. It is now MRD negative, no evidence of disease. And oh, and most interesting, she was CD19 negative plasma cells. So, she, and, and it's not 100, it was 99.05% uh, 99 negative. She had a 0.5% positive set of CD19 positive cells. Nevertheless, the whole thing went down. She actually recovered her B cells, which is, I think, not a good thing, um, uh, and uh, didn't really experience anything more than a serious, and this is six months later, against medical advice. She was uh, uh, skiing in Vail. But, um, so, so what happened was, about 15 months later, we, um, I'm trying to think, we did a routine scan and saw a, um, a pla an extra medullary plasma cytoma. Evaluated her otherwise, nothing else. Gave her, and, and sort of, and it was CD19 uh, um, positive. Interesting, but we didn't have the ability to squirt it anymore. So we decided, let's give her some daratumumab and melt it away. And so she is now over two years from that treatment with that progression, but no evidence of, she was in another complete remission. Um, 
we treated 10 patients with this. It's not 100%. Three of the 10 patients have had remission inversions. Seven did not. Um, um, but that is much, we, ha we looked back, I don't know, have you looked back? We looked back at our, at our prior transplants, salvage transplants. We really have never had a remission inversion with a standard salvage transplant. So we see this as a positive thing. And, and incidentally, what we're doing right now is a follow-on study doing, doing the anti-CD19 uh, infusion after the first auto-transplant in high-risk patients. So if you have any patients, we, they have to have cytogenetically high risk disease and we're just doing initial therapy which you can do uh, stem cell transplant in the standard way and then squirting in the anti-CD so we'll see the only and but as I've suggested this is not the um, the major setting this is not the logical target for uh, CML, I mean for, <laughs> for multiple myeloma, the logical target is BCMA. So BCMA, the B-cell maturation antigen, is virtually 100% expressed on plasma cells, though the, 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 assess, the assays for it are really screwed up. What we, so what we're doing, uh, so, we're, we, so we, have a, we have a BCMA trial at Penn. We're not part of the Bluebird and stuff like that. At our study, though, we are not doing it. We're doing assays, but we're not using that to determine eligibility. So, so we're, we're not, we're, if there are relapsed refractory patients, we're assuming that everyone's going to be BCMA positive. And in fact, that has been the case. When we use our assays, they're all positive. We've sent 11 specimens yeah. to. I know, it's torture, right? And zero. Yeah, I know. I've heard wrong. this. I've heard this. This is the problem. So, so what we did, but, but so, um, so let's see. So, so our study is to take a person who has relapsed refractory disease, and this is Adam Cohen who's in charge of, of this study at Penn, and then they, they, you know, they get a T-cell leukapheresis, and our first cohort of patients, after they cooked up the cells, they, we just gave them the cells. No lymphodepleting chemotherapy, whatever. Um, and then, um, but in our next cohort, we, we're giving cytoxin. And so here's the first patient who got the anti-BCMA. 66-year-old guy, 11 prior lines of therapy, um, and was full of disease. He was BCMA positive by flow cytometry. And we squirted in the cells, no lymphodepleting therapy. He, did, he developed grade three cytokine release syndrome in a similar fashion as, um, as uh, the ALL patients getting the disease. And, um, and had a tremendous improve, and, and actually had persistence of his cells, and then had a tremendous drop to complete remission of, of his uh, monoclonal protein. He's in a strict complete remission, no evidence of disease, and, and that has lasted for about nine months now. Incidentally, update of our CART-19 experience as well as our BCMA experience is gonna be oral presentations at the uh, ASH meeting. Um, the, the guys at the NIH have done this also. They reported 12 patients using the BCMA, and that's what the ba is based on the Bluebird stuff. And you know that, that a subset of those patients did respond. There was some CRS. I think CRS does predict for who's going to respond, though not everyone with CRS responds. So it's a really cool thing. But it's not everybody. It's not everyone with the BCMA. It's not everyone with the CART-19. So we, we're going through a whole bunch of different ways of trying to improve the likelihood of response to these cells. You know, give it earlier, uh, prior to the development of resistance clones, uh, give better lymphodepleting therapy, dose intensity of the cells, serial infusions, engineer the cells for greater potency. I don't know if you heard, but we were actually gonna, you, we, we applied to the rack and got approval to do CRISPR editing of the, of the T cells to try to make them a little bit uh, more potent and to take away PD-1 and things like that. Um, and perhaps cocktails, perhaps giving uh, anti-BCMA um, and then there's a whole bunch of other approaches, uh, the, the bispecific um, antibodies, um, using T-cell receptor uh, engineering, et cetera. So successful immunotherapy started uh, with lenalidomide and pomalidomide. The monoclonal antibodies um, uh, have really uh, 
uh, become a part of myeloma therapy and as you heard may become the initial therapy. Checkpoint inhibitors when combined with this seems to activate things. There's multiple promising targets for the cellular therapy um, and we've proven that functional CAR T cells can be removed and engineered for uh, myeloma um, and the age of immunotherapy for myeloma is upon us. So thank you very much. It, it takes a, a, a village of course and there's the whole crew. This is the, the guy who's going to win the Nobel Prize is Carl June. And um, David Porter's the guy who did the original studies with CLL. And of course, these are all the other doctors, the nurses, the research people, and the people who really do all the work. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Science fiction. Come to life. How fast can you turn around that? getting it back to the patient. So, so literally two weeks. Though most, but we prepare for um, uh, up four weeks, I think. I think we, you know, in terms of planning, we make it four weeks, but, but we can generate them. That's only because of the, you know, there's a queue of patients and we don't want to tax the processing lab, et cetera. So obviously this is all done in-house. Our processing lab is making these cells and generating them. It's way quicker than yeah, but I'm sure that, you know, techno you know uh, engineering will make these things a lot better as they become more and more uh, proof of principle. All right. Get home and enjoy. Anybody My pleasure.